zone. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No war. Hang on. Welcome to a very special Vintage Video Patreon pick, where our patrons at the $100 tier are invited to request any pre-1980s title they'd like for a custom review from the Vintage Video team. Overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today, Carlos Moda has asked us to review The Warriors. Released February 9th, 1979, it was written by David Shaber and Walter Hill, based on a novel by Saul Urich, directed by Walter Hill, and released by Paramount Pictures. Anabasis, a.k.a. The March Up Country, was composed by ancient Greek soldier and writer Xenophon. It told the true story of a combined army of 10,000 men marching into Persia under the leadership of Cyrus the Younger, intending to seize the throne from his brother Artaxerxes II. When Cyrus was killed in the invasion, the army fell to pieces. Xenophon himself took up command and led the bulk of the army safely back to the coast of the Black Sea. In 1965, Author Saul Urich adapted this ancient story into his novel, The Warriors. He was inspired to adapt the story as an antithesis to the overly romanticized West Side Story with a grittier take on New York gang life. The title was a reference to the full amalgamation of gangs controlling the city, and the plot focused on the journey of the Coney Island Dominators. The film rights were bought initially by Roger Corman's American International Pictures, but abandoned when Corman left the studio to found New World Pictures in 1970. They were bought by the film's eventual producer, who hired David Shaber to adapt the novel. Yurik was ecstatic to have anyone interested because he thought his book was too violent and weird to ever get a movie. Gordon and director Walter Hill had just had a Western project fall apart, and this opportunity landed at the perfect time for both of them, and it came together very quickly. The swan role was offered initially to Tony Danza, who had to turn it down because of a schedule conflict with television series Taxi. In his role as producer of Ridley Scott's Alien, Walter Hill watched a recent Israeli film called Madman to get a feel for actress Sigourney Weaver's abilities when he spotted Michael Beck in the same film opposite her. Hill was very impressed with the work of Thomas G. Waits, but supposedly Waits refused a drink that Hill offered him somewhere in a pre-production meeting. This was enough to spawn a rift between the men that spiraled out of control, to the point that Hill had his character killed off randomly, improvised mid-scene <laughs> during the movie's shoot. But I don't want the drink. Drink the drink. <laughs> drink the fucking drink. They shot mostly on location in New York in the midst of several real-life unfriendly gangs who were constantly harassing and threatening the cast over the course of the shoot. Many off-duty police officers were brought on to maintain a safe boundary to work in. During the theatrical release, the film's screenings were plagued with instances of gang violence, likely because it played to a demographic of gang members who wanted to see a version of their own story and encountered rivals in the theater. Posters that repeated the film line about gang members outnumbering cops were removed from the film's advertising and even bleeped out of the film in some releases. Why? Because it made cops un <laughs> uncomfortable that people were pointing out, hey, we outnumber the cops. Oh, so, so they had to take it out because it was accurate. Yeah. Posters were regularly vandalized by gangs. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a vandalized Warriors poster in the background of another movie? Um. Very early. Another Paramount film. There was one in the background of American Gigolo when he throws the senator's aid against the wall and there's a graffitied Warriors poster behind them. In 2005, Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption's developer Rockstar Games adapted the film into a Warriors video game that starts as a prequel to the film, but the second half plays through the events of the film. Around the same time, Tony Scott was talking about helming a modern day remake, but it evaporated after his sudden death. In 2015, a reunion of sorts was organized involving several members of the cast called Last Subway Ride Reunion, in which they discussed their recollections of the production while traveling by subway along the same path across New York. As recently as 2016, Infinity War and Endgame directors Joe and Anthony Russo had been talking about a Warriors television adaptation for Hulu, and in 2018, the project moved to Netflix, but no idea where it is now i would like to see that i think that'd be fun i think it'd just be fun to 
tell the stories of all the different gangs instead mm-hmm. of just focusing on yeah. the one gang the whole time. Yeah. Unfortunately, the version of the film that's easier to find nowadays is the director's cut, which has a lot of crappy looking illustrated comic book interstitials. That's <laughs> not how the theatrical cut went. And it's all like Comic Sans font. It's just like, what are you doing? This looks so bad. So was that, when you say it's a director's cut, was that like added Very after recently. the fact? Yeah. Okay. Because usually director's cut is just a longer version of no the this is just like uh I, this is the vision that i always had of how this would work out and he came back to it and made it look like trash and it's like this is why i tell people not to watch director's cuts because they're usually worse than the theatrical cut this version starts with a drawing of the battle of canoxa in 401 bc we see spartans fighting against an onslaught Over two millenniums ago, an army of Greek soldiers found themselves isolated in the middle of the Persian Empire. One thousand miles from safety. One thousand miles from the sea. One thousand miles with enemies on all sides. Theirs was a story of a desperate forced march. Theirs was a story of courage. We dissolve from a drawing of the Wonder Wheel Ferris Wheel in Coney Island to footage of the wheel turning at night. Do you guys recall the last time we saw Coney Island for the podcast? Times Square? More recently. Actually walking around on one of the roller coasters. Um, The Wiz? The Wiz! Next, we are entreated to a subway train pulling into a station at night. A man named Cleon speaks to the rest of his gang, the Warriors, that nine delegates of their gang will attend a meeting hosted by a man named Cyrus. We see a long montage of different gang groups all converging on Cyrus's big meeting. The first group are the Warriors, dressed in brown leather vests, some with feathers and bands in their hair. We see a gang in purple waistcoats and fedoras, the Boppers, a gang of mimes in suspenders and top hats, the hi-hats this is the gang i would choose to belong to because they look the (laughs) coolest to me and also they're supposed to be like the the gang with irish ancestry so Mm. that's probably where i'd end up anyway we see a gang in che Guevara style paramilitary outfits the panzers a group in jeans and gray sleeveless shirts the gladiators a pack of what look like sherpas on a subway platform the savage huns (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and the electric eliminators with matching yellow varsity jackets. I I thought that they looked like um the friend in the Emperor's New Groove. Oh yeah. Yeah, with they, the same the same they hat. They have the hats. Yeah. They have like these Peruvian looking hats. Yeah, they are kind of Peruvian looking. <laughs> uh, but it reminded me more of um what's his name that plays uh the guy with the six demon bag in Big Trouble in Little China. Walter you leave Jack Burton alone. But that guy in The Golden Child. Right, right. You know right. how he's dressed in that movie? It's like the little fortune teller guy who's always picking on Eddie Murphy. You're, you're talking about Walter from Tremors, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cleon tells a member of the warrior delegation to tag up the area where the meeting is taking place so they can prove they were in attendance. This will backfire later. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the warriors are worried about wearing their gang outfits in unfriendly territory, but others invite any challenge. Opinions on Cyrus vary from warrior to warrior. When you're president of the biggest gang in the city, you don't have to take any shit. Ah, uh, fuck him. All the gangs gather together in a huge group in an amphitheater at night. This is Van Cortland Park in the Bronx. This scene made use of more than a thousand extras. When Cyrus addresses the crowd, he points out the strength they have in numbers. Nobody is wasting nobody. That is a miracle. And miracles is the way things ought to be. If all these gangs can manage to maintain peace and operate in tandem with each other, they outnumber the local police three to one. 60,000 soldiers ready to fight. Now there ain't but 20,000 police in the whole town. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Do you guys recall the last time someone asked, can you dig it repeatedly in New York? Saturday Night Saturday Fever. Night Fever. There you go. <laughs> okay. I All knew right. that you could. <laughs> it was like we were both on it. Yeah. And then, can you dig it? I knew that you could. I'm going to be drawing some parallels to certain things, but uh, a lot of John Wick. Yeah. Is going to be a lot of, because Cyrus, uh, Lawrence Fishburne definitely draws a lot of Cyrus as the Bowery King. Yeah. There's also a lot of 300 to the general story mm. here. 
but it's scaled way down to nine. <laughs> Cyrus says that if they could take the town, they can tax everyone and run the territory officially themselves. While he speaks, we see a pack of police cruisers roll up to the venue with their lights off. As the crowd celebrates Cyrus's plan, we see a gun being passed from person to person across a gang called the Rogues, who were told not to bring weapons to the Great Truce. Cyrus raises his hands in the air, and David Patrick Kelly as Luther, one of the rogues, collects the gun and shoots Cyrus in the chest. After taking out Cyrus, he locks eyes with one of the warriors, and the crowd scatters. Police rush the scene. Cleon watches Cyrus die in the hands of his own gang, the Riffs, on the ground. Suddenly, Luther points out Cleon and claims that he was the shooter. Cleon tries to defend himself, but Luther makes such a scene that everyone attacks him, starting with Luther. Cleon knocks out the first three guys who take him on, but after that he disappears into a crowd and is beaten, presumably to death, because we don't see him again in the film. The warriors are cornered against a wall and punch their way through a fence to escape the park, leaving Cleon behind. This whole gathering of the gang scene was based on a real-life event in the early 70s at which gang member Black Benji was assassinated while advocating a citywide peace talk between several New York gangs. Unlike the film, though, the shooting did not inspire a rioting and did lead to an eventual permanent truce between the relevant gangs. The warriors get to a nearby cemetery and hide amongst the headstones as police roll by with their sirens blaring. They take a head count and only Cleon didn't make it out. Unfortunately, nobody else knows that Cyrus's death has been pinned on them. Michael Beck as Swan leads the conversation in Cleon's place since he is technically the gang's war chief. They have a long journey home, and if the truce is off, which it definitely is, they will face a lot of resistance along the way. James Remar as Ajax offers some predictable resistance to Swan's assumed leadership position. I only got one question. Who named you leader? I got as much right to take over as you. Swan invites Ajax to fight him for the title of warlord, just as a train arrives and the warriors book it to the station. A warrior named Rembrandt tags a big W on a nearby headstone as proof they were here. And this is the problem, it becomes like a breadcrumbs mm -hmm. leading people to them. We cut to the headquarters of Cyrus's gang, the Gramercy Rifts in Gramercy Park. Their new leader orders the warriors presented to him. I want them all. I want all the warriors. I want them alive if possible, if not wasted. The word is put out through the voice of Riff's citywide pirate radio DJ. Listen up, gum shoes. <laughs> <laughs> for all you boppers out there in the big city, you people with an ear for the action, I've been asked to relay a request from the Gramercy Riffs. It's a special for the warriors. That's the real live bunch from Coney, and I do mean the warriors. Here's a song with you in mind. Nowhere to run to, baby. Nowhere to hide. This version is Arnold McCullers' cover of the Martha and the Vandellas Motown hit. So uh, they just recently paid homage to this in John Wick 4. Oh, really? Uh, when John Wick's on the run, they have a radio DJ, and it's just close up on her mouth yeah. at, the, at the microphone. Oh, that's and great. And she puts on a, a variation, uh, not the same version of Nowhere to Run, but a, another cover oh, that's of awesome. Nowhere to Run. All right now. For all you buppers out there in the city of lights, for all you street people with a ear for the action, I've been asked to relay a special request. This golden oldie, and I do mean golden, hit goes out to you, Mr. Wick. And remember, there is nowhere to run. We see groups of elaborately costumed gangs patrolling the streets in search of the wanted warriors. We see the Baseball Furies, in their Yankee stripes, plucking Louisville sluggers off of bat racks in their hideout and taking to the streets. Can we talk a minute about this one? This, this gang? This gang. They're a fucking cool looking gang. <laughs> are, they, are they cool or are they, is it just really weird? No, they're, they're the coolest. And I think they're so cool looking that they actually get the cover of the warriors rockstar game there's that there's they put those guys on the front instead of the actual warriors did they get to bring their bats because that's part of their outfit as long as they had a glove in their trunk right isn't that the rule 
<laughs> you're not allowed to drive around with a bat because it looks like it's for fighting with unless mm-hmm. you have a baseball and a glove in your in your that's car. Hilarious. I didn't know that rule. But I think that's a real law. I, I'm sure I'm sure it is. I, I believe you. Um Okay, but these guys aren't just in baseball uniforms. They right. also have like face paint. Yeah, they look like they're members of Kiss here with with their goofy ass yeah. uh, face paint, and I just, I'm just you just gotta like sit and think about this for a minute. These guys get ready for the night. It's they for put show. On, it's for they a, it's a, their, their big date night of the year. Socks and their poofy pants, mm-hmm. and then they start putting on their makeup. I think like, this is their Halloween a little bit. This is not. This is not an every night outfit. I don't oh, know. I think it's. Every I night. think it is an every night thing because like, and that's the weird thing about it. It's like these guys are just going around looking like crazy weirdos all the time. Whereas, like, somebody else is just wearing, you know, like, a regular outfit that just happens to match somebody else's regular outfit. I think those people are half-assing it. And, and honestly, fuck those gangs. The <laughs> gangs, the gangs that, that could fit in with civilians, fuck them. Those people <laughs> suck. And that's boring. Like the orphans? Yeah. If you're going to be orphans. a gang at all, then you need to fucking put on some face paint, get a goddamn uniform, and theme your weapons. Yeah. I just, ugh, I don't know. This is so weird. I mean, I'm assuming that... The, the territory in and around Yankee Stadium. Must, I, that must, would be my guess. Must yeah. be theirs. Yeah. But also wanted to point out that the, you know because there's a lot of mythology that goes into this story, obviously, right, yeah. from the original story. And, and names like Ajax right. and, and, in this case, the Furies yeah. uh, are all stemming from mythology. Yeah, because the Furies were, what, from the Odyssey or? Well, they, they were like the, 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 like the punishment yeah. gods or like they, they, they administered punishment. Yeah. The warriors wait under a train platform for their ride to arrive when a busload of Turnbull ACs roll by looking for a fight and they duck for cover. I think they forgot about the truce. No shit. The Turnbulls loop around and the warriors make the insane judgment call of running out in front of their bus and racing a quarter mile down the street in front of them. Why don't you do this on the side in the shadows where they can't see you blatantly or can't even hit you with their car? But uh, instead you ran directly in front of them. They barely get to the train before it takes off, and they successfully shut out the rival gang. Word gets back to the rifts that the Turnbulls fucked up, and when we cut back to the train, a fire near the tracks forces them off the line. Weirdly, though, nobody's here waiting for them, <laughs> which would presumably be the point of setting a fire in the first place. Like, right. you'd be waiting to kick their asses when they got off the train. Yeah, because somebody was there to set the fire. Yeah. Luther from the Rogues reports to his bosses that the Warriors killed Cyrus. So he wasn't ordered to do this by his bosses. He took this initiative on his own. And now he's lying about it. Some of Luther's cohorts are worried that the Warriors might clear their name and then the Rogues will be in trouble, but Luther assures them that won't happen. On their walk, the Warriors cross through a territory of a gang called the Orphans, a small enough group that they didn't even know about the meeting. At first they're insulted. How could this be a big meeting if the Orphans wasn't there? They even wave around some clippings to show off how bad they are, and the warriors try to flatter them into allowing them passage. And but their their uniform is just like wearing like the same pants and shirts. Yeah, it's like we all wear hand me downs. We just trade clothes every couple days. But what if you're not an orphan? Do you can you still be a part of? You got to kill orphan? your parents. That's part of the initiation. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> <laughs> these guys are badasses. They're the, most, they're the most hardcore. But they also like did it when they were young enough that they weren't provided for. The flattery works perfectly well until a girl named Mercy interferes with the proceedings. <laughs> to save face, the leader of the orphans makes a demand of the warriors. They have to take off their vests if they want to pass through orphan territory. They refuse to comply. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> fucking idiots, just do it. Jesus. I, like, can you carry them? Yeah. Like, or do you have to leave them? If it's just a pride thing, though, that you're like, no, I'm yeah. not going to take my vest off. But that's exactly what <laughs> it is. It's cold. That, yeah. But that's what these gangs are. Like, taking your colors off would, would be the equivalent of, you know, just kind of like rolling over. It's like, nah, I'd rather one of us gets killed in a skirmish in the next 20 minutes. With the orphans. <laughs> the fucking lamest gang in the world. If one of us gets killed by the orphans. I'm going to kill the rest of us. Starting with myself. <laughs> How's that going to work, Swan? <laughs> the rest of you will be underneath me. <laughs> what? Sex. What? We don't do that. It's just our mark. It don't mean we're at war. You go as civilians, okay? You go as soldiers, I got to come down on you. Now take off your colors. 
Can you hear me? Fuck you. <laughs> 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 oh, what an idiot. The gang split up and Mercy follows the warriors away. Ajax grabs her by surprise and she basically asks to join them. Swan isn't super receptive. Maybe we ought to pull a train on you. You look like you might even like it. Fuck you! The orphans show up again and the warriors distract them with an explosion before running to the safety of the next train. Wait, so the trains are just running again already? Do they no, put I out think that they fire? went forward to stop where yeah. they could catch the next one. Oh, okay. One. But how did that train get past the fire well they both go they go back and forth up to the point oh, of the okay. fire and there's trains stuck on both sides of the fire word makes it to the rifts that the orphans have also fucked up and slowing the warriors but they're like wait the who <laughs> what are you talking about the bees are on the what now <laughs> the warriors find the next station swarmed with cops so they split up some of them make the train and the rest proceed on foot during their scuffle with the police one of the warriors is thrown in front of an arriving train as i mentioned before this change to the script happened on set that day, as Walter Hill could not stand another production day with Waits. Consequently, Waits asked not to be credited in the film. His romance with Mercy was rewritten to involve Beck's swan character. As the gang leaves the station, they pass a couple of civilians, and the bearded man in a blue sweater here is director Walter Hill. I mean, I think that actually killing him here is a pretty effective move for the script. I don't, Somebody had to die. I, I was going to yeah. say, you, you, the stakes are so much higher now that you're just yeah. like, look, it's not just these gangs, which we already believed were going to kill them. Now the cops are going to kill them? Yeah. We came out with nine people and we're down to seven. Yeah. And very quickly shrinking. Unfortunately, they find themselves in the territory of the Baseball Furies and a chase ensues. The warriors look surrounded in a park, but manage to wrestle away the bats and fight back. I'll shove that bat up your ass and turn you into a popsicle. What kind of popsicles are you eating? <laughs> a meat popsicle. Latest sports news off the street, boppers. The baseball furies dropped the ball, made an error. Our friends are on second base and trying to make it all the way home. The warriors who made the train are greeted at the next station by a pack of women who successfully lure them off the train and back to a house party. Sirens, perhaps? Yeah. yeah getting more mythology stuff. But they call them the Lizzies. I wish they had called them the Sirens. Yeah. Moving through Central Park, the walking warriors spot a woman alone on a park bench and Ajax wants to rough her up. I guess you don't know the parks ain't safe after dark. We ain't got time for this right <laughs> I just like the way he decided to say that. It's like, don't you know this area is not safe? I'm supposed to fuck anybody up in this area. Swan leaves without him, but a couple guys circle back to make sure Ajax doesn't land in too much trouble. He tries to force himself on the girl and suddenly finds himself handcuffed to the bench because it turns out she's an undercover cop. Ajax is panicking and tugging hard on the bench and the cop's backup is taking a weirdly long time to respond to her rape whistle. But eventually they cart him away and that's the last we see of Ajax in the film. We cut back to Swan in a subway station and Mercy shows up again. She's wearing a jacket now, and Swan makes a weirdly big deal about forcing her to explain where she got it. This is because during an earlier scene, she and actor Waits were running together, and she fell and broke her wrist. So the jacket is covering a cast. And they were like, we need to keep talking about this jacket we covered it with. <laughs> she can't just have been cold and yeah. had a jacket. Yeah, I found a jacket. <laughs> the end. I took it off a person. But like, maybe just a quick insert of her grabbing a jacket, if you really like, care. Yeah, but I. But nobody cares. Nobody cares. She tells him that Ajax got arrested. Another cop shows up here, and they start running. Do you guys recall the last time we saw a chase sequence in an abandoned subway platform? Yeah. The Wiz? The Wiz. I, I, I was getting serious The Wiz flashbacks, flashbacks here. as I was watching this. Swan throws the stolen bat at the running cop's legs just as more police arrive, and he and Mercy race down the steps alongside the track away from the station. The Lizzies lead the remaining lost warriors to their apartment. Yeah, I hate asking the question, but uh, where's the dudes? Chicks like you always got dudes around. They took the night off. The warriors are invited to take their pick of the girls lazing around the place. One of them can plainly see it's a trap, but his warnings are ignored. Back to Swan and Mercy walking the track and officially introducing themselves. Swan can barely mask his contempt for her. In fact, he doesn't mask it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the way you live. The way I live? Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly they're kissing. Swan doesn't seem as attached to Mercy as she wants, and then he walks away from her down the track. 
We cut back to the Lizzie's party, and suddenly they're all pulling out knives and guns and inform the warriors that word on the street is they killed Cyrus. Shit, the chicks are packed! The chicks are packed! No. <laughs> they scramble out of the Lizzie's hideout and manage not to lose any members in the ensuing fight. Yeah. It's like you had all of them in your house. You could have shot five of these guys at the same time. How did you screw this up so badly? Uh, so it was at this point that I started paying attention uh, apparently throughout the entire movie, and I had not noticed, they've been using Star Wars wipes. Oh, really? Like like diagonal wipes and, and open as those. Like, oh my God, I feel like I'm watching Star Wars all of a sudden. <laughs> I feel That's like that weird. probably went hand in hand with the re-edit with the comic books. Yeah, yeah, it could have been. They duck into a nearby alleyway and make plans to find the rest of the warriors to warn them what they've been accused of. Swan exits an empty subway station alone. He looks around suspiciously for a bit, and then we see he's being followed by a gang in denim overalls on roller skates called the Punks. All the warriors except Swan reconvene in the subway and make plans to find their acting leader. Mercy finds Swan in another station and warns him that the Punks have a tail on him, just as the rest of the warriors show up. Swan gestures with his eyes to send the rest of the guys to hide in the men's room and then follows them with Mercy in tow. Wait a minute. I can't go in there. It's a men's room. Are you kidding? The punks follow them inside and are swarmed by more warriors than they expected to find in here. A violent brawl commences, and the warriors capably hand the punks their asses and walk out relatively unscathed. They didn't lose anybody in this fight. The leader of the Rifts is informed once again that the warriors are still at large, but a witness to Cyrus's assassination has come forward to describe the shooter. As they continue riding the subways home, the warriors are soon joined by a mildly intoxicated foursome on their way to a prom, or home from a prom, probably. It's pretty late. This this is one of my favorite parts of the movie. I, I the the just to the, remind you that this is the real world. <laughs> yeah, it's the real world, and and they're just kind of like staring at each other, like like oh man, this is like what who we could have been. Yeah. If circumstances were different. Yeah, and they're just like these dirty, scary people on the subway. They notice how disheveled the warriors appear and go quiet before leaving at the next possible stop. One of them drops a corsage on their way out. Their last train pulls up to the Stillwell venue, and the warriors seem home at last. Swan hands Mercy the corsage. What's this for? I just hate seeing anything go to waste. As they stalk their home turf, the warriors are approached by a graffitied hearse full of rogues with Luther in the passenger seat. For her own protection, Swan tells Mercy it's best if they all split up, but here she refuses. When they veer off the road out of the car's path, Luther clicks three glass bottles together with his fingers and calls to them with the film's most quotable line. Warriors, come out to play. Warriors, come out to play. Actor David Patrick Kelly supposedly improvised this line. The warriors prepare to fight off with the rogues on the beach. Swan tells Luther they're on their own turf now, and on top of that, Swan has deduced that Arthur was the actual shooter at the Cyrus meeting. Why'd you waste Cyrus? No reason. I just like doing things like that. I still feel like this would have made more sense if the cops paid him or promised him something Mm. in exchange for doing it. Luther points a gun at Swan, and Swan sidesteps his aim before whipping a switchblade into his hand. A similar knife-to-hand disabling a gunman move shows up in Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Luther still gets a shot off, but manages not to hit anyone with it. Yeah, I thought for sure... Maybe he's gonna shoot Mercy or something? Yeah, I thought for sure someone got shot. Yeah, but uh, but nobody's hit, and suddenly the riffs are here. (laughs) But but Luther's reaction is just so so entertaining and so <laughs> satisfying. He's just like on the ground, and no one else is doing yeah. anything. It's like when Kurt Russell has his accident at the end of uh, of Death Proof, and he's just like <laughs> screaming and screaming like the biggest like the biggest baby about it. The Rifts confess that they've learned the truth of what happened and commend the warriors on their survival in the face of all the city's gangs. They offer to take charge of the rogues situation and make a path for the warriors to leave through. Good news, boppers. The big alert has been called off. Turns out that the early reports were wrong. All wrong. Now for that group out there that had such a hard time getting home, sorry about that. I guess the only thing we can do is play you a song. You can also say our names. You said our names when you told everybody to murder us. When you're going to print this retraction, why don't you mention who we are (laughs) so that people stop trying to kill us everywhere? 
and the DJ puts on Joe Walsh's In the City, written specifically for the movie, but the Eagles liked the song so much they recorded a version of it on their next album, The Long Run. That's The Warriors, everybody. Big thumbs up. Oh, yeah. Thumbs yeah. up. Yeah, I, 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 this is, I don't, I wouldn't say that this is the first time I've seen it, yeah. but this is probably the first time I really paid attention to it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's, a, I had a good ride. I like uh, it because it's such a well-established universe and there's so much detail to all of it, but mm-hmm. it's a really simple story. It's so story. simple. That's yeah. the thing. Okay, so I, was, I had seen this movie before, but I'm glad I got to watch it again. I really liked this movie. Yeah. And, and, and that, that has everything to do with it for me. It's like the story is so simplistic, but not in a bad way. In a, in a, it's I like am, this is all it needed to be. It's mm-hmm. all it needed to be. It is, it is so easily understood and, 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 it's, and it's so impactful. You are just so instantly in like the, oh shit, I understand the dread mm-hmm. that these guys are going through in yeah. each of these moments that it, it doesn't need to have a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and and you want them to succeed, but also like some of them, like Ajax was like, oh, I don't care what happens to you. <laughs> yeah. But the, I mean, they're all terrible. Like Swan's like, Hey, mercy, all of us are going to rape you in a yeah, row. No. Yeah. It, <laughs> like, they're, they're, they're all, they're all bad people. Uh, that's, that's, but because you know that's the whole nature of like a yeah. gang is like you're you're, it's you're organized s- crime yeah. mm-hmm. you have to be criminals but uh but yeah like i i feel like more of them should have died like i i do think that it would have made more sense if there was only like four or five left at the end yeah I, uh because because honestly they only lose like what the two of them yeah they they lose cleon off camera and they lose the guy to the passing train, mm-hmm. which was improvised in that moment. So nobody was supposed to die other than the leader in the original draft. And I don't understand why Luther points out the warriors instead of pointing out the gang that the one guy was associated with. The guy who comes forward, who's the guy who saw him pull shoot. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what gang that guy was in. Right. But Luther saw him and he saw Luther. And- but he knows Cleon saw him, too. Like, Cleon saw him do it. Yeah. That's why he blamed Cleon, so that the, it would be one man's word against mm-hmm. another. Uh, which, to me, again, uh, Cleon, or uh, the leader of the Rifts. Uh, the one that died, Cyrus? No, no, the the, the, the one who takes charge of the Rifts after. Oh, I forget that guy's name. Uh, he seems really reasonable. Yeah, like, I mean, he wants them alive at first, at, at the yeah, very least. Yeah, he, he, he wants them alive. He wants to hear their side of the story. If possible, yeah, you know. But if they resist, then you, you, what can you do? Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I feel like like they could have probably defended themselves in a court of public opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's a very organized system for that. I like the cast too. I think um, this is such a different character from Michael Beck. From the only other thing we've seen was Xanadu with him. Um, but he's he's like plays such an active role here he's constantly fighting and he's so grumpy and angry all the Mm -hmm. time and in the other movie he's just like happy-go-lucky dancing boy um but yeah i i really like this one and and i honestly would be excited for a tv show remake or just a straight feature film remake i just think it's a fun story and and i want to see somebody else take a shot at it even if they do it more specific to the book and they do the the Coney Island Dominators, but yeah. I mean, you could still call the movie the Warriors because mm-hmm. it's about everybody being warriors. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love the idea of it being an expanded universe and yeah. just going more into their, you know. Or if they do it like uh, Arrested Development season four style, where you tell the same night from the story of each individual gang's perspective. Yeah. That was the season four, right? That oh, did that? Uh, I actually must admit I did not watch the fourth season. Oh, okay, I think that's the one where they tell one character story each episode. It sounds very frustrating. It's terrible. <laughs> it was a bad way to do it, but I think it would work better for this if it, you're if you're following one gang through each night. Because that's how the first three episodes of the second season of Lost went. Yeah. And as much as I love the second season, those first three episodes are infuriating to watch on a weekly <laughs> basis. It was like, God, we already saw this. Yeah. Our director here was Walter Hill. After this, we've seen his work on The Long Riders and Southern Comfort. Later, he directs 48 Hours 1 and 2, Brewster's Millions, and later Last Man Standing, Supernova, and an episode of Deadwood, among many others. The novelist here, Saul Urich, uh, he, he wrote the novel adapted into this. He also wrote the novel adapted into 1999's The Confession, as well as the 2005 
Warriors game, obviously. The writer here, David Shaber, after this he wrote Those Lips, Those Eyes, and Nighthawks. And later this season, he writes Rollover, and later uncredited work on The Hunt for Red October. Very uh, eclectic batch mm -hmm. of titles. The music here came from Barry Devorzon. Amazingly, he was back next year to score Michael Beck's follow-up film, Xanadu, and he also scores Exorcist. But uh, uh, we also just had him uh, on the score for Looker, which either comes out this Saturday or came out last Saturday, depending on when this episode drops. Who knows? Cinematographer here was Andrew Laszlo. We've seen his work previously for The Fun House, Southern Comfort, and later he lights First Blood, Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins, Poltergeist 2, Inner Space, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, Ghost Dad, and Newsies. The editor here was Freeman A. Davies. This was his first editing credit, and he later cut When Time Ran Out, Long Riders, and Southern Comfort. He later lights 48 Hours, Last Man Standing, and The Horse Whisperer. Another editor, David Holden, this was also his first credit. He also cut Long Riders, Bustin' Loose, and more recently, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, which I love that movie. That's not recent. More recently, I said. <laughs> but uh, Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag, I, I always think of this scene where David Spade is on the phone with uh, Joe Pesci. He's mm -hmm. like, hey, can you tell me if this sounds like a guy hanging up a phone? And then he hangs up the phone. And <laughs> you just see Joe Pesci's side of the conversation like, yeah. God damn it! He just starts smashing the phone on the wall until he completely destroys like an airport payphone. Uh, editor, th third editor, Susan E. Morse later becomes a regular editor for Woody Allen, starting later in '79 with Manhattan, and we've seen her work on Stardust, Memories, and Arthur so far. Editor Billy Weber, that's the fourth editor, uh, he was an editor on several Terrence Malick titles. Later he cuts Iceman, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Top Gun, Midnight Run, Pure Luck, Grumpier Old Men, Bullworth, Miss Congeniality, Geely, Nacho Libre, The Love Guru, and most recently Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the movie, last year. Which one is Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? That's, that's post uh, Michael Bay produced it, it might be one of the animated films yeah i think it is the the most recent fully animated one before the seth rogan animated one michael beck played swan after this he shows up in 80s classics xanadu battle truck and megaforce good titles james remar played ajax he's named after the greek warrior as we mentioned amusingly of the entire gang he uses the most anti-gay slurs and shows up next year in cruising as pacino's gay neighbor We've seen him so far as two Native American characters in Long Riders and as the Young Windwalker. Next season, he shows up in Partners and later the Dream Team, Drugstore Cowboy, Judge Dredd, and he takes over the role of Raiden from Christopher Lambert for Mortal Kombat sequel Annihilation, but he's probably best known for playing Dexter's dad on Showtime's Dexter. Dorsey Wright played Cleon. He also shows up in Hair and Ragtime, but not much after the mid-80s. David Harris played Cochise. We saw him last as Dwayne Spivey in Brubaker. He was also Luther in MacGyver episode Final Approach. Tom McKittrick played Cowboy. His only other credits are two loop group jobs for Heart Beeps later this season and Angela's Ashes in 1999. <laughs> it's like 20 years later. Terry Mikos played Vermin. He's also Jimmy Jett in The Great Skycopter Rescue, which we'll get to eventually. Stop bugging me for The Great Skycopter Rescue review. None of you. Deborah Van Valkenburg played Mercy. This was her first film. We saw her last in King of the Mountain, and she's back later as Reva in Street of Fire. So I guess in King of the Mountain, she's the singer slash mm -hmm. love interest of the of the lead character guy. David Patrick Kelly played Luther. This is his first credit, and probably his most famous. Uh, he's back for 48 Hours, Beverly Hills Cop, Commando, Wild at Heart, Malcolm X, Last Man Standing, and more recently he's appeared as Charlie in the John Wick films and Paul Chambers in one episode of Succession. Lynn Thigpen played the DJ. She's Lynn in Godspell, Joe in Tootsie, Motor Woman in Streets of Fire, Grandma Walker in Blank Man, Female President in Bicentennial Man. But most importantly... But most importantly... She is the chief in the Where in the World Carmen Sandiego game show. Carmen Sandiego's multitude of misbegotten mutants has struck again. This time, they did their double dealing in the desert of Peru. Ginny Ortiz played Candy Store Girl. I don't know if I even mentioned this character, but after Luther calls his gang and says, oh, the Warriors shot Cyrus and everything's going crazy, then they're, they're at like a candy shop and he throws a bunch of candy at a lady because she asks for money for it. Right. And he's like, for what? 
She played Trini in 23 episodes of Three, Two, One, Contact. It's the answer. It's the moment when everything happens. Contact. Three, Two, One, Contact. We also saw her as a Puerto Rican girl in Willie and Phil. Mercedes Ruel played police woman. She's the mom in Big. <laughs> She's the one who's, <laughs> whose kid disappears. That's yeah. the lady who handcuffed Ajax to the bench. She was also Anne in The Fisher King and the mom in Last Action Hero, who starts flirting with Arnold Braunschwager, <laughs> or whatever he <laughs> says his name is. John Snyder played Gas Station Man. This was his first film. He has voices in various anime dubs, including Lupin the Third, Mobile Suit Gundam 3, Akira, cowboy bebop he also voiced katano in the battle royale dub he was sid in final fantasy 6 e honda in various street fighters we also just saw him as hawker in tattoo later he plays dieter moffat in one episode of silk stockings his character in this film was intended to reappear in a separate scene as a member of an all-gay gang with doberman pinchers and blonde wigs called the dingoes who briefly take swan hostage kevin bacon would have made his feature film debut as another member of the gang but the scene was cut somewhere in production. How cool would that have been? Yeah. They would definitely have to explore that on the TV series if they did one. And I, I know that Walter Hill has said that he greatly regrets having cut that scene, but that it was they were already over budget and over time and everything. But it's just something that should have happened by then. And they, they weren't treated any differently than any other gang. George Lee Miles played a Gramercy riff. He was previously a pimp in The Taking of Pelham 123 and Preacher in Malcolm X. Kevin Stockton played another Gramercy riff. He was one of the people at Aunt M's party in The Wiz. Carrot played Turnbull AC, or Karat, C-A-R-R-O-T-T-E, Karat, played Turnbull AC. He was a puppeteer in Frankenhooker. Marvin Foster played a Turnbull AC. He was a guy trying to buy crack at the beginning of Michael Jackson's Bad video. Johnny Barnes played a Turnbull AC. We saw him last portraying Sugar Ray Robinson in Raging Bull. Rob Ryder played a Baseball Fury. He was one of the hunters in Southern Comfort. Steve James played another Baseball Fury. The first sentence of his IMDb biography says, Steve James was often cast in action movies as the hero's sidekick, despite usually being a better actor and fighter than the star, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think I said the same thing when we saw him in The Exterminator. And he also appears in Vigilante, the Soldier, and as Curtis Jackson in the American Ninja films. Lisa Moore played one of the Lizzies. She's a commune member in Simon, and she's back next as Ethel in Jaws 3D. Doran Clark played a Lizzie. She was MacGyver's love interest in the first season's James Bond-themed episode, The Heist. Victoria Vanderkloot played a Lizzie. She was the pen thief in The Fan. Do you remember the, the, the fan got her to sign an autograph and then took mm. the pen and ran across the street and then... Uh, Michael Bean like tripped her or something because <laughs> he was so <laughs> mad at her. Craig R. Baxley played one of the punks. That's a gang called the punks. Those are the guys on roller skates. Uh, he is the director of films like Action Jackson, Bad Day on the Block, written by my friend Betsy Giffen Narasta, the Red Rose miniseries, and Left Behind 3. A.J. Bakunas played another punk. We saw him last as Eli's script clerk in The Stuntman. Gary Baxley played another punk. He was Lion Man in the 77 Dr. Moreau. We'll see him next as Bill Lynch Sr. in Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Conrad Sheehan was another punk. He was Glenn Elwood in Brew Baker. Tommy J. Huff was another punk. He was Lenny in The Rocketeer and Diaper Van Driver in Speed 2. Irwin Keyes played one of the police. That's the giant policeman who arrests mm -hmm. Ajax in Central Park. He was nearly cast in the part of Ajax and awarded this part as a consolation prize when they changed their take on the character. We've seen him so far as a busboy in Friday the 13th, The Exterminator, Stardust Memories, and The Private Eyes, where he was the hunchback character. He's back for Exterminator 2 as a henchman in Black Dynamite and as the killer in Evil Bong 3. Sonny Landham played a police officer. He was Billy Bear in 48 Hours and Billy in Predator. Randy Feelgood played 8th Avenue Apache leader. He was a dancer in Saturday Night Fever, and we also discussed that he shows up as Zoot Boogaloo in Back to the Future. R. Michael Fierro played a gang member uncredited. He has a producer credit on Jim Cummings' Thunder Road. That's the, the more recent Jim Cummings. Mm. Antone Pagan played gang leader on Subway Stairs. He was Hector in Stripes. UFO follower in Stardust Memories, sleazebag vendor in Times Square, and a cop in Fort Apache, the Bronx. 
Pamela Poitier played Lincoln, Cleon's girlfriend, in deleted scenes. This was her first film, but like I said, the scenes are deleted. She is the daughter of Sidney Poitier, and I actually worked with her sister, who was also named Sidney, on the set of Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror. Robert Townsend played one of the baseball furies. That's yeah. the director, Robert Townsend, uh, who we last saw in Willie and Phil, but who later appears in Rat Boy. He also wrote and directed Meteor Man, and he stars in the titular role. Meteor Man is considered by many to be the first major film centered on a black superhero, though a case could be made for 1977's A-Bar the First Black Superman. It's just a matter of if that's a major feature film. I need to check that one out. Thomas G. Waits uh, played Fox, who was killed by the train. He asked to go uncredited after problems with Walter Hill, and he's back next season as Windows in Carpenter's The Thing. So he's still got some cool credits. That's everything for the Warriors. Thanks again to Carlos Moda for their generous contribution to the show. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find all our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing whatever you chose. (laughs) 